Have you ever been injured so bad that you couldn't move? I don't know if you've ever been hurt like that before. I want to tell you a story. When I was a junior in college, I tore my ACL playing basketball. It was awful, terrible injury. It took a long time to recover. But I remember it like it was yesterday because I remember what happened. I was, I believe it or not, I was trying to play defense, all right? And so I had my arms out and uh, the person I was guarding went this way and I tried to go that way with him and my knee snapped in one part of the leg went one way and one part of the leg went the other way, is at least what it felt like. And I just immediately collapsed to the ground, uh, felt like I couldn't move, and I was just stuck there, right? And so when that happened, my friends, like, they stopped playing, they came over, they checked on me, and I'm like, guys, I can't move. And so they, like, they, like picked me up and they carried me over to the side and got me water. Eventually, they uh, helped me get to my car and then back to my dorm and all that kind of stuff. And I tell you that because I want you to imagine for a moment what it would have been like if I um, got hurt, I got injured right there in the court, and no one helped me. What it would have been like if I, I, I fell down, and I'm like, guys, I can't move, and they just kept playing, right? Like, they were dribbling around me, and I'm just, like, laying on the court. Eventually, I, like, slide my body to the side. Nobody helps me to my dorm or asks me if I need any help or checks on me. I want you to imagine what that would have felt like. How do you think that would have made you feel? probably alone, right? A little bit uh, isolated, maybe angry at people because there's people around you that maybe should care about the fact that you're hurt or uh, need help and weren't doing anything. Now, that's a hypothetical situation, but let me ask you this. Imagine, imagine that you convert to Christianity and your life is immediately in danger and you feel like nobody cares, Now, that's a little bit of a different type of question, and it's also not a hypothetical question, because there are people around the world who experience that very thing every single day, where they come to the faith in Jesus, they call themselves the Christians, and and because of that, their life is immediately in danger. Now, today we're going to be talking about praying for our persecuted family as we start this a um, few weeks series right before spring break talking about um, praying. And really what this is, is about moving our prayers beyond safe, normal, uh, routine prayers that we find ourselves in and saying, uh, God, thank you for this day. Keep us safe, um, which is okay if you pray that, but that becomes a routine thing. And moving ourselves to praying um, for things that really matter and things that could change the world if we gave them a little bit of our attention. And so today, we're going to be talking about praying for a persecuted family. Our job and our responsibility as Christians uh, to do that. Every year, if you've been around engaged for a while, we do this every year because it's a passion of mine. And I want to bring it to the front in, uh, of attention for you in your life of, of helping you understand and recognize what the responsibility is for you in your life as a Christian to not ignore those who are hurting and who need our help. I want you to see these words from Paul um, as he talked to the church about being one body. I mean, you're probably familiar with that passage in 1 Corinthians where he says, uh, the body is made up of many parts. We all have a part to play, right? And so he says these as a part of it. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And there are parts, when you think about the body of Christ, the global body of Christ, the church, that are suffering, that are hurting, and that need our help. And so that's going to be the focus of our attention tonight. The question is, is what do you do about it? Because if you're like me, oftentimes we can feel a little bit helpless. How do I step in? How do I help? What do I do? What's my role, my responsibility? And you feel like I can't fix this, but there is a job for us to play. To play. And um, it comes with the part of prayer. And so I've got three words for you tonight that I want to bring to your attention. And then we're actually going to spend time doing this and not just talking about it. And so I want to bring this to your attention. And uh, the first one is the word no. You have to know what is going on, know what's happening in the world. I want to talk to you for a few minutes just just about what's going on in the world. Let me talk to you about India, right? Um, India is special to me because I got to travel there a few years ago. Um, And at all these tables over here, we'll talk about them in a minute, but we've um, India doesn't even rank into the top 10 most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian, but there's a lot of things that are happening there um, in a lot of places in the world that it's far worse than this. India is divided up into 28 uh, states in India, and um, uh, they're all across the country, and they operate very differently than you would think that like a state in the United States works. 
they're very much isolated in the sense of they get to determine what they do. And so the overall government in India works differently than states than like what it does in America. And so these states, these 28 states, all of them have the freedom to deal with uh, religious laws and views and uh, things like that how they want to. In 11 of these 28 states, they have come up and, and put into act what is called an anti-conversion law. And what that means is that it's, it's against the law uh, to have forced conversion, right? To force someone to convert to a different religion, which sounds great, right? Nobody would want to be forced into converting into a religion until you recognize what that law actually means because they also add these words, in, inducement and temptation. And so what that means, it targets Christians because any human, humanitarian work that they do is viewed as inducement or temptation. So think of this, you give food to people who are hungry, well, that's viewed as inducing them to convert to your religion. You do run a program that is free for people that helps them, whether it's healthcare or whatever it is, well, that's viewed as temptation. You're trying to tempt them to come and be a part of your faith. And so Christians are literally under attack in 11 of these states in India simply for being the hands and the feet of Jesus. And it's a problem because they're constantly being watched. They're constantly being threatened. They're being put in prison. They're being abused. Um, sometimes even killed. In fact, the government in many of these places just turns their eye. And so if you want to hurt or harass or kick someone out of your village who's a Christian, the government usually just turns their eye and lets that happen. Here's why. The belief in India um, is that Hinduism, to be India, to be, sorry, to be Indian is to be Hindu, okay? So Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world. Once you think about that, behind Christianity and Islam, Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world. 94% of Hindus live in India, all right? You wrap your mind around that. 94% of, of people who are Hindus live in India, and that's the third largest religion in the world. And so the belief is that to be Indian, right? To be Indian is to be Hindu. And so uh, they have this thing across the entire country where they're literally trying to just get rid of Christians to be anything other than Hindu, is a disgrace. Our partners, CICM, have been under attack for some time and uh, actually have had to go in hiding and a little bit on the run just to stay uh, alive, to protect themselves. That's what's happening in India. In Somalia, Somalia is a very dangerous place to be a Christian. The insurgent group uh, Al-Shabaab has gone under this uh, mantra to eradicate all Christians in their country. You know what that means? Uh, to get rid of them, whether they kill them or make them flee the country, they are trying to eradicate Christianity from their country. I hope you know this, but in North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian, it's illegal. It is, Ill it is, it is illegal to be a Christian. If you're found to be a Christian in North Korea, you're put into a slave camp um, or you are killed. That, those are the two options. They either put you into a slave camp, a labor camp, or you're killed. In China, which actually China, um, the China, China has an underground church. It's actually thriving. About what we learn as we look more into about 75% of the churches in China, which are underground house churches, are led by women. And so it's actually a thriving faith community. It is growing. But because of all the surveillance, they have to do church underground and to hide and protect themselves. Christians are under attack in this world. And so what you experience in your day-to-day -day is not reflective across the globe of what people who share your same faith live with every day. Some of them live with fear or hiding, um, and, and they deal with this every day. And for anyone who thinks about converting into Christianity in some of these places, you're talking about your family disowning you, your village kicking you out. I mean, there are severe consequences. And so I simply tell you those examples to tell you that you need to know what's going on. You need to know. You need to be in the know. If, that, if we're going to do anything about persecuted Christians, we can't turn a blind, blind eye to this or just not pay attention to it because we live in America and it's not like that here. We need to know what is happening. So to keep this more in front of you, I encourage you to follow these two things on social media, um, Global Christian Relief and uh, VOM USA, which is Voice of the Martyrs. And so I tell you that if you just follow those on Instagram uh, or Facebook or whatever you're on. Uh, they might even be on TikTok, I'm not sure. And so if you follow them, you just get constant like reminders as a part of your feed. So if your feed can remove from like, hey, here's all the great things happening in everybody's lives, but maybe just a little bit of like, 
here's what other people go through, or here's how to pray, um, or here's some, some things that we can do for persecuted Christians, just add it to your feed, and then it'll be a part of your life a little bit more. If you do email, sign up for their email updates. I'm on both of these. And you get stories and prayer requests as a part of your inbox, and it's just another way to be in the know, to know what's going on, and to be in the know. So I wanted to bring those to your attention. So we have to know, but beyond that, we have to go beyond just knowing, we have to care, okay? You've got to care about what is happening and have it move you. I'm going to give you an example, okay? So um, over the past uh, 15, 16 years, I've actually been blessed to go on a lot of different mission trips. I've been on 13 different trips. And uh, I've been um, to India, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, um, a couple different places, Honduras. And I've got to see the church in different ways. And I've got to lead a lot of different teams, some student teams, adult teams, just a lot of different experiences. Here's one of the things that I've experienced as I've led teams, because not everybody that I go with, a lot of them, on every single trip that I take, I'm always with someone who's, for the first time, they've been out of the country, okay? So I'm constantly like starting over, like, here's what you need to know, here's what you're going to expect, those type of things. Here's one of the things I've experienced as I've led teams, and it's kind of like a pet peeve of mine, and I don't know how to move past it or to approach it nicely, but I'll just put it out there for you. I've been on, on teams where Every time someone sees a stray dog, you've been on a trip, seen a stray dog, and you go, aw, that poor puppy, that poor dog, it's got no home, or it's eating scraps, or, you know, and we look at it, and we go, man, that poor puppy, and in my mind, I'm just going, what is wrong with you, right? Not, listen, I have a dog, so don't think I'm a dog hater, okay? But, but think about this for a second. Sometimes I feel like in those moments, I experience more care and concern from people for a stray dog than for the souls of people who don't know Jesus and of why we are on a trip like that. It's backwards, right? We see like a puppy and it's hurting or it's hungry or it's skinny or something like that or doesn't have a home and we, we feel that compassion and yet, do you feel and do we feel the same thing for either people who don't know Jesus or maybe people who are being persecuted for their faith? I want you to think about that. I don't want to shame you if you've ever felt sad for a puppy, okay? That's not what I'm trying to do, all right? It's okay to feel that. But we have to put things into perspective. I simply share that and tell you is that you can read the articles, you can watch the videos, you can be in the know, but you have to care. You have to, you have to care about people and to care about your brothers and sisters across the globe who experience persecution. Apostle Peter actually wrote an entire letter that was to a persecuted church. You can read it First Peter. Um, that entire letter is to Christians who were experiencing persecution in the first century. He commends them for their faith and uh, their willingness to suffer and to be faithful in the midst of it. And he cared for them. Peter actually eventually died for his faith as well. He actually experienced persecution and was killed for his faith as well. In fact, all the disciples did as well, with the exception of the Apostle John. Apostle John was the only one who did not, uh, was not a martyr, did not die for his faith. And so John uh, wrote these words to the church in the first century as well. First John chapter three says this, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And this is an interesting verse because these words right here, has no pity, that's the center and the most important part of this verse of what John is trying to say. It actually is better translated in, in the Greek as um, translated like this, closes their hearts towards them, okay? So I want you to think about it like this. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but closes their heart towards them, how can the love of God be in them? It's this Greek word, splagnon. It's kind of a strange word, but it's the meaning of like moving the inward parts inside of you, your gut, your heart, like everything on the inside that would move. This word is also used when Jesus, if you're familiar with the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, everybody remember that in Sunday school, right? Where Jesus saw 5,000, or 5,000, it was actually more than 5,000 people, but he saw 5,000 men and they were hungry. And the scripture says that he had compassion on them. You know what that word is? It's pity. It's splagnon. It is, it's compassion on the inside. He was moved by what he saw, and then he did something, right? And so what John says to us in this sense is this. 
How can you hear of people suffering for their faith and have no compassion on them? How can the love of God be in someone who reads a story about someone suffering for their faith and does nothing about it? Or at least that's how I read it. How can the love of God be in you? Because when you care, when you care here's what you will do first. This is where I want to end with us tonight, is that you'll pray. The very most basic level. I'm, tonight, I'm not going to ask you to write letters. I'm not going to ask you to donate money. I'm not going to ask you to do anything special. I'm going to ask you to pray. Because this is the foundational and the most important thing to do. It's our, it's our responsibility in helping Christians. We cannot see someone with their leg twisted on the floor and hurting and just walk by and not do anything. Our responsibility is to pray. Paul reminds us that we should pray about everything. Look at these words from Philippians chapter four. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, when you do this, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we don't worry, we simply pray. James reminded us of this. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna, I'm gonna stop talking, all right? And, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna recognize that we have brothers and sisters around this world who are hurting, who are being persecuted for their faith by simply following Jesus. And if we can't do anything in this moment but pray, that's enough. Because that's 100 prayers in this room tonight going up for people around this world who need to know Christ. If you've been with us before in this, um, what we do is, um, we focus on something that's called the World Watch List. It's an organization called Open Doors who puts out this list, and they go through categorically and rank places around the world based on um, relationships and government and experiences in the community, all just, I mean, a bunch of different things. You can look it up on their website. They go through all these types of things, and they rank the top 50 most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian, okay? So one to 50, and they give them a number, they scale it, um, and, and, and so we have this list of the places that are most difficult in the world to be a Christian. So what we're going to do in a moment, after I pray, is we're going to watch this video. It's going to introduce the world watch list to us. And then we're going to take that moment to respond. And there's a table over here, a table over here, and there's actually one back there as well. So we have three. And all I'm going to ask you to do is come up and to grab a sheet. And on that sheet are two different countries. And you can read a little bit about the situation there. You can read some things to pray about. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to pray for that and just take a couple minutes, pray for both of those places, and then you can come up and exchange it and grab another one. If you're like, what do I pray for? What do I do? If you're really, really struggling, don't know what to do, right here, these blue pieces of paper kind of give you some sample prayers that you can pray. I, I'd imagine that most of us can pray, but if you need some help, those are there for you as well. And then the other thing I'm going to ask you to do as a part of this, if you're feeling like you uh, can take this to the next level, do it with somebody. Okay, so instead of sitting in your chair by yourself praying silently, which is fine, okay? I'm not telling you that you can't do that. Grab a friend, look at the places together and pray together and do it out loud. You're gonna have plenty of time. You're gonna have like 15 or 16 minutes to accomplish this, okay? So you'll be able to come up, grab, uh, exchange the sheets a couple of different times. But my prayer and my hope is that when you leave today, this can be something that you do often for persecuted Christians around the world. Not just once a year when I tell you to do it, but something that you can bring in front as a part of your life um, often. Pray for persecuted Christians to stay strong. That's what I'm going to ask you to do.